So self-awareness and self-management are keys to our ability to empathize with others. Welcome to Your Intended Message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who address the challenges and best practices to deliver your message effectively. That might be one-to-one, -one, one to few, or one to many. And perhaps the most important conversation, one to self. I'm your host, George Torok. My guest today is Dr. Helen Reese. Here's three facts that I think you should know about Dr. Reese. One, she is an empath empathy researcher at Harvard Medical School and a clinical psychiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital. She is author of the best-selling book, The Empathy Effect, Seven Neuroscience-Based Keys for Transforming How We Live, Love, Work, and Connect Across Differences. By the way, her TED talk, the, the TEDx talk, The Power of Empathy, has been viewed more than 650,000 times. That's a lot of views. Second key fact, her de definitive, definitive research proved that empathy is not just an inborn trait. It can be taught and learned. And that, I think, is the key message for us. And three, Dr. Reese is the CEO and founder of Empathetics, Inc., a tech ed company founded in 2011 that offers an online and live empathy education program that is used in healthcare, business, and law enforcement to transform organizations into more compassionate entities. Dr. Helen Reese, welcome to your intended message. Thank you, George. It's a pleasure to be here. Delighted to be talking with you and finding out a little bit more about this thing we call empathy. Most of us have probably heard the word. Many people probably have their own idea of what they think it is. Please tell us your your definition, your what empathy means to you, and most importantly, what it's not. That is a great opening question, George, because many people have a sense that they know what empathy is, but it's actually uh, more than one thing. It's an umbrella term because people often confuse empathy with just being nice or kind. Empathy is is uh, involves quite a few brain structures that enable us to perceive the emotions of others. Of course, that means we have to pay attention to the emotional signals, right? So it helps with perception of emotion. It helps with taking the perspective of other people. So it means taking off our own spectacles and putting on the lens that somebody else is wearing to see the world through their eyes. Empathy involves what's called affect sharing, which means that when we see somebody in an intense emotion, we actually share that emotion to some degree because of how our brains map other people's emotions on our own um, brain structures, which is why when we see somebody really sad and sorrowful, Sometimes we get a little misty and teary ourselves, or when we're around people that are just elated and happy, it buoys everybody up. That's called shared affects or shared emotions. And then empathy works with all of these brain parts to process what other people are thinking and feeling, which then motivates empathic concern, which is really what gets us to do things to help other people. And then the output after we feel that concern is what I call care and compassion, because that's what comes out of us. So empathy is really the input that allows us to, to perceive and understand. And then based on many factors, 
including just how well we're taking care of ourselves, we have the ability to show caring and compassionate behavior coming out of us. So I'm hearing uh, that empathy is one receiving, receiving signals and, and interpreting them and sending out our own messages, our own signals to, to comfort or provide support. Right. Empathy is the vehicle for the output. Because usually when we say, oh, that person's very empathetic, we think of them as somebody who's sensitive to the feelings and situations of other people. And when we say that person is very compassionate, it's usually because we think of them doing something, you know, bringing a meal, holding their hand, giving a caring facial expression. So that compassion is the output, empathy is the input. But most importantly, those brain structures that help us perceive actually lead to a motivation, right? Because we could be looking at very sad images on TV and not be motivated to help. But empathy, when we really perceive, we often feel like, I want to do something about that. And we don't always follow through on that motivation, but that I think is the key um, with empathy is that it gets people interested in trying to help other people and understand them. So the first part is observing other people, observing their emotions, their emotional state, and understanding. So in order to understand other people's emotion, I suppose we first need to understand our own. Well, that's a very astute observation, George, because, you know, just like your podcast title, Your Intended Message, we have to think about what is our intended message, right? So in order to relate to somebody, we first have to make sure that we're not just, you know, emoting from whatever's bothering us that day. You know, if I'm in a lot of traffic and get stuck on the highway and then can't find parking and I show up at work, I might be showing up quite disheveled and unrelaxed uh, based on my experience. And then if I'm meeting you, um, in order to be open to your experience, I first have to settle myself, right? So self-awareness and self-management are keys to our ability to empathize with others because we can really only manage only so many people's intense emotions at once. And if we're in the middle of our own, it's really hard to be open to maybe the emotional suffering or emotional concern of somebody else. Is it possible to get empathy overload? Well, you know, People often ask, doesn't empathy become a burden? Can't you just end up feeling too much distress, too much personal distress because you've taken on some, you know, too many other people's? Well, the answer is empathy in itself allows us to perceive. And then if we get overwhelmed, it means that we're not really regulating either our exposure to how much suffering is around us or just separating out what are my feelings and what are this other person's. So there's a really interesting part of the brain that allows for self-other distinction. And that means that I could be meeting with somebody, and as a psychiatrist, I do this often, I meet with people who are in a lot of distress and if I let all of that distress just build on itself within me, I would be completely exhausted and upset at the end of every day. But through self-regulation, I can perceive someone's distress, I can be moved by it. And I also am able to use cognitive structuring to say, I can be most helpful if I really address their distress, but not get too involved in it myself. You know, we've all been upset and have someone who gets so upset, they just start crying with us. And they're just as overwhelmed when we really need that person to 
maybe extend a helping hand or a calming comment, or if it's someone close to us, a good hug. Um, but just everyone dissolving into misery and distress doesn't really help that much. Mm. I'm curious about the concept that empathy can be learned. How, what what what's where does the learning start? And typically, like any skill, so if it is a skill that can be learned and can be honed, where does one start? Where does one start to to say, okay, am, how's my empathy level? How do I improve it? So, importantly, empathy is a mutable human trait, which means it changes. It's not the same. Like I'm not, I don't have the same empathy every single day and either does anyone else. So when we talk about empathy, we have to realize it can be blunted. So as I said before, if you're around too much pain and suffering, you can, you at some point might have to limit your exposure or really, you know, take a breath and, and step back or even take a day off because there's only so much the human mind and heart can absorb. So when we tamp down empathy, we are at risk for losing it if we don't replenish and we don't kind of reset to be sensitive to other people. And the reason I got into all of this empathy research is that through my own experience working with patients and just reading the media, there has been a time when patients are really saying they don't get enough empathy and care from their doctors. And I was seeing that as a major problem because if you don't feel cared about, you're not that likely to follow recommendations or even wanna come back and see that doctor. I was really on a quest to see if, if you can beat empathy out of people, can you also bring it back? And a lot of people said, no, if once you're burned out, that's probably it. Like, or maybe those people never had any to begin with. And through my research, I realized that we are most empathetic when our cha channels are open, when we're really focusing on the other person and not so much on ourselves. And that there are ways to enhance our perception of other people. For example, by learning to read their faces accurately, because the human face is actually a roadmap of emotion. But if we're not looking at each other, you're gonna be missing what people are feeling. And of course, during this pandemic we're in, when half our faces are covered, it's even more important to pay attention to what people are saying with their eyes and to, you know, to, cause actually our eyes and our forehead is where most emotion is actually expressed. So the good thing is that even if we cover our mouths where we can, you know, it's easy to fake a smile, but it's very hard to fake the other emotions cause they're expressed in the eyes. And so, so our face being a roadmap of emotions, it, so on one hand, we can use it to show empathy or interest or concern for other people. At the same time, we can also perhaps read somewhat of what they're feeling or going through. Well, George, it's actually the other way around. We first read the emotion in others and through these specialized brain cells called mirror neurons, we catch other people's feelings. And you know this happens like when you go down the street and someone smiles at you, you don't even think about, oh, I think I'm gonna smile back, you just do it. Or if you see somebody really teary and sad, usually our faces start to mimic that and that's called um, muscle or facial mimicry. These mirror neurons actually get our faces to take on the shapes of other people. And believe it or not, when our muscles are in the shape of a sad emotion, we actually start to feel sad. Like this muscle memory is quite intricate and and quite precise. Now, um, it's curious. I'm, I'm at, so we reflect in our face, we reflect what we see in others. 
I'm guessing we only do that if we feel comfortable with that other person. If, if we're not comfortable with them, do we still reflect? A lot of this reflection is done unconsciously. I mean, even it even happens through television. Like if you're watching a movie where all of a sudden the main character is like, like terrified or, you know, or really sad, we, we start to feel something. And it's not just because we care about them. It's because this facial recognition process is taking place. What should leaders be doing in the workplace to take advantage, uh, uh, to use empathy, not misuse it, but to make it part of how they manage and lead? Well, I'm going to use the title of your podcast again. What is your intended message? Do you want to come in a room and like show everybody that you're the boss and that you're dominating? Or do you want to come in a room and take a look around and notice, like make eye contact, like show the people that you have noticed them as individuals and that they matter. One of the most basic leadership qualities is to remember that the people in your organization are human beings. They're human feeling beings who want to feel acknowledged and appreciated for what they're doing. And that to me is like the secret ingredient to having people bring their best to work, which is I matter here or this workplace values me. You know, many leaders will say, oh, yeah, the people in my organization, they're the most important. But then you have to scratch the surface a little bit and, and say, well, how do they know that they are the most important? You know, do, do you check in with them? Do you if somebody's got a sad facial expression, do you just say, oh, hi, how are you doing? Or do you say, am I right? You look a little upset today. Is everything OK? It doesn't mean we have to take on every single person's problems, but just by checking in, like someone might say, you know, my cat, my 17 year old cat passed away last night. And, you know, you don't have to fix that problem because you can't, but you could say, I'm so sorry. You know, it must have been a big, a long attachment. These little micro acknowledgements that people have lives outside of their work humanizes the workplace. So that sounds like the leaders don't necessarily need to, to do a, a whole lot to show a little bit of understanding, a little bit of empathy. It's, it's just actually just have a human conversation and maybe notice how people might be feeling based on what we're seeing. Well, that's part of it. And it's a really important part. And it doesn't mean we go around and do a one on one check in with every single person. But if, if leaders made a note to say to themselves, I need to notice these people at least like once a month, like say something that's personal or maybe once a week. I don't know how big the team is. The other thing leaders can do, and this is really important, too, is keep track the extent they can of important things that are going on in a person's life. So if someone's, you know, spouse or parent just died, offer some condolence and maybe realize that maybe their work isn't going to be, you know, 110% for a while because they're, they're in sorrow. Same with somebody planning a wedding or getting divorced or something big, like a little understanding of what people are going through actually helps them want to do more for you. But ignoring it, ignoring something big will just make them feel like a cog in the wheel. And, you know, when we say you don't have to fix everything, there's no way a leader can fix everything, but also having supports in place for when people need to talk to somebody or have a mental health issue, that they know that there's a place to go. On that last note, 
what are the signs that there's not enough empathy in the workplace? Well, one of the easy signs is disengagement. You know, people coming in late, leaving early, um, and in our Zoom world, are they on time? Are they, you know, missing meetings, coming to meetings late? So signs of disengagement often mean that your heart isn't in, isn't in your work. Importantly, especially since this is an epidemic today, signs of burnout. So burnout has three major characteristics. The first is just emotional exhaustion, that people just don't have energy for it. They are dragging their feet, they're, they're not uplifted. The second one is depersonalization. And that's just a fancy word for not treating people like people, but more like objects. So you'd say things like, oh yeah, that guy down the hall, he's, he's needing that report again. Or, you know, that jerk downstairs just keeps bugging me. So it's not like Bill down the hall really needs that deadline. It like people start using distancing terms. They also, um, and this is when you're live, spend less time going to each other's offices. They just close off. So that's depersonalization. Um, in medicine, it sounds like oh, that person with diabetes in room 400 needs, you know, needs a nurse again. So in, like referring to people by their diagnosis instead of their names. Um, and then it's decreased effectiveness at work. So a sense that no matter how much you do, you're not doing it well. You just don't feel like you're, you know, getting the results or that your, your efforts are getting the results that you want them to. You just don't feel like your work is, is up to par and you don't feel like you're good at it anymore. So these are signs that people need to know that if they're starting to feel these things that they could be getting burned out. And burnout is also an umbrella term. I mean, it could mean you're getting a depression which needs treatment. It could mean you need a day off. It could mean you need a week off. <laughs> um, and it could mean you need to start talking to somebody, some supportive person or a group to just try to make sense of what's happened to you in the last year and a half when the whole world turned upside down. So finding ways um, to heal and recover from this, this pandemic, um, that's something Empathetics is very dedicated to doing right now. It's like providing workshop materials so that organizations can learn how to bring people together and heal and recover and make sense of what this has meant to them. Dr. Reese, for those that are interested to learn more about the programs that you provide both live and online, they can find that information at your website. The link is below, but for those who would like to write it down right now, it's empathetics.com and empathetics is E-M-P-A-T-H-E-T-C-S, empathetics.com. You can find out more about the programs. At that same place, they can also find out about more about your book, the power of empathy, uh, which is also, or sorry, let me correct that. That's the name of your TEDx talk. The book is The Empathy Effect, Seven Neuroscience-Based Keys for Transforming How We Live, Love, Work, and Connect Across Differences. They can find that information at the same website. They can also find your book on the usual booksellers. Uh, Dr. Reese, in, in wrapping up, if you could offer one, two, or three helpful pieces of advice to, to business leaders to better show and convey empathy in the workplace, what might be those pieces of advice? I, I would categorize 
those three things into attitudes, skills, and behaviors. Having an attitude that your people in your organization are your most valuable asset. You know, a lot of leaders think about getting stuff out of people, getting them to write the reports, getting them to call the clients, getting them to make sales. Uh, these people will give you so much back if you have an attitude of how lucky you are to have them and to show appreciation. The second is skills. What we talked about earlier today um, is how am I perceiving the emotions of others? Not taking them on, but just am, am I opening my eyes to seeing these people as people and noticing what their faces, what their posture is conveying, their tone of voice. And then the skills are managing ourselves. And as we said, the first step is self-awareness, you know, make sure you're in a centered place and have the skills to either check in with someone who's not doing well. And if somebody's not performing, rather than having punishment and punitive measures be your first stick. How about acknowledging, it looks like things aren't going as well as they were before. Is something going on? So use curiosity before judgment. That's a really important behavioral um, adaptation, let's say. And make a point to check in with people, not just about how their work is going, but how their lives are going. Mm, powerful, powerful pieces of advice. My guest today is Dr. Helen Reese, reminding you that the face is the roadmap of emotions. If you like what you heard, remember to like, comment, and share this podcast. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you deliver your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok.